Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Dave. Uh, just wanted, first of all, this is our first meeting discussing the COVID uh, Community Information Champions uh, Scheme. And I believe the audience tonight should be just people who volunteered to be champions and obviously councillors as well. So firstly, I'd like to thank all those people who volunteered, who've come forward to take on this vital role and obviously to help us fight the threat of COVID in the community. Now, uh, two main parts basically of obviously, Dave's explained that anyone can be a champion and uh, the point of this is to spread information around the community, uh, which is why all of you received the weekly newsletter advising where we're up to with things, what we're doing and you know, what the current situation is. But as Dave said, we're also really keen to hear your feedback. If you see something in the community that doesn't look right to you and you want us to look into it, please fill in the form on the website and let us know. And any questions tonight, basically at all, about any of the speakers or anything generally, submit them on Teams. We'll try and answer them later. And if not, basically we'll come back to you after. So uh, the way it's going to work tonight, um, in shortly I'm going to introduce the first of our speakers. Uh, there are three of them tonight. The first is Ingrid Slade, who is the head of public health, consult the P Public Health England consultant at Working Borough Council. She's going to talk about the virus and where we are at the moment with that. Secondly, Dr. Rupa Joshi, the GP from the Woodley Centre Surgery, who's going to talk about the vaccination programme. And last but certainly not least, Jake Morrison, who's the head of the CAB in Wokingham, who's going to talk about the one front door system. Now, for those of you who don't know, that's the point of contact for anybody who needs anything in the borough at all. Uh, they're all going to speak and talk about the current situation as they see it. Any questions, please uh, submit them on Teams and we'll try and get to them after. Uh, on top of this, basically, uh, I wanted to mention a couple of brief things. Uh, WBC is trying its best to support all local businesses during COVID-19 and there is support available for anyone who needs it. If any of you are aware of a business that may be eligible, please encourage them to visit the WBC website to apply for support. Uh, we are there to help and we do have plenty of you know, central government money to give out to those people who fit the relevant criteria. Finally, we're keen to know a bit more about people who volunteered for the Champions Scheme. So we may target our messages a bit more effectively and make them sharper and more resonant. We have sent out a brief survey that includes questions about any of the groups they represent. We'll send this out again with follow up material from this meeting and we'll be very grateful if anybody, any of you can spare a few minutes to actually fill this in and pass this information on. So on that note, I will finish for now and hand over to Ingrid Slade, who will take over from here. Thank you, Charles. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening to talk about COVID in Wokingham. My name's Ingrid Slade, and as um, Charles said, I'm a consultant in public health um, at Wokingham Local Authority at Wokingham Borough Council, and I'm also head of public health there. I'm a doctor by background and, um, and then I've trained to become a consultant in public health. So for those of you that don't know public health, which why would you before COVID necessarily, we, um, the people who are consultants in public health are similar to the consultants you might go and see for your, for orthopaedics or for cardiology. We've done a similar training program program um, to become consultants after medical school and then sit within local authorities and help to um, promote and work towards the greatest health and well-being for our populations. And obviously COVID came along and um, posed a significant challenge both to public health and to local authorities. But I'm not here to talk about the past or the past year, but I'm here to talk about where we are right now. And I think the best way for me to do that and also to, for those of you that haven't seen it, is to share with you the Public Health Berkshire website. So I'm going to share my screen um, just to go through some of that data. I'm going to presume you can see it unless somebody shouts. Um, I also can't see any hands when I minimise this bit. So if anybody um, wants to interrupt, please just um, go ahead. Otherwise, I won't be able to see. So this um, is the Berkshire Public Health website. You can go connect into this from Wokingham Borough um, Council's COVID webpage. Um, or you can go directly to the website, which is very simply berkshirepublichealth.co.uk. And when you land on that website, um, this is designed 
by the public health team that's shared across the whole of Berkshire. And it'll give you an immediate um, insight into our guidance where we currently know we're now in, in um, lockdown, obviously. But if you scroll down, you will automatically see the daily cases across Berkshire as reported. It's a live feed update. So this would have been updated at approximately four o'clock today, along with the national figures. From here, you can click into any of the local authorities, but clearly um, <laughs> for us today, we would like to go to Wakenham. So you go down here to the, the COVID-19 dashboard, which is where we get all the um, information, either by clicking onto Wokingham or by dropping down the menu. And this will tell you the daily cases that there are new cases today, the total cases we've had so far in the pandemic. And also, uh, so this is a graphic form of our daily cases. The, in, the figure that we're all most interested in or that gets reported the most in the press, obviously, um, and that we follow is the um, weekly rate per 100,000. There's a few things that everyone should know about the weekly rate, though, when they're seeing this, is that it lags a week behind the actual case numbers. So when you're seeing a seven day rolling rate, there is a week's lag. So that said, when we're looking at, at the graph here, if you scroll along with it, you will also see the actual number, which is given below, and I scroll down in a minute. So today, so this is as up until the 13th, we're at 401.5 per 100,000. And you will all know, I'm sure, that we, um, as t in terms of our um, case rate, we have passed our peak and are um, down now reducing in our case rates and in our daily numbers, thank goodness. This looks odd because you will remember that last year when we were in lockdown, there, was, there wasn't the level of testing that we now see. And so that is why we have a much more informed picture here. But it is thought that we have more cases now than we did then. Um, and that is largely because of the number of hospital admissions that we're seeing, because obviously that was recorded last year and we have more hospital admissions now than we did last year. If you want to compare where we are compared to the southeast, you can click on this box and you'll see that overlaid. And again, if you want to see where we are compared to England, you can see that overlaid as well by clicking those boxes. But for ease, the most up to date weekly rate is down here um, for your for you to see. And then in addition, we have these these um, for for interest, really, I guess, but also for um, knowledge when the case rates go up and the numbers go up, as you might expect, the people phoning 111 in Wokingham also goes up, as does our 999 calls um, specifically for Wokingham. In terms of, and you can see that that's reflected the um, picture that you saw above. Interestingly, um, the online assessments haven't moved in quite the same pattern. And obviously that's something that the CCG um, are aware of. So if you click over here, this is all about cases and new cases um, relate on a daily basis. This is updated every day. The national figures are updated at four o'clock and that will be um, pulled through straight away to our um, cases here. And then um, death date data for Wokingham and everyone is updated on a weekly basis. And again, we need to point out the significant time lag in um, the Office of National Statistics death data, which comes through quite some um, approximately a two week time lag. So we need to just be um, aware of that as we look um, at those figures. And um, we can see the um, excess deaths at the moment. We are not seeing any excess deaths in Wokingham from this wave of the pandemic. But one other thing I'd like to point out around the data is that when we see a peak here, and we start to reduce the hospital admissions and the hospital pressure on the NHS system lags behind this by about 10 to 14 days. So they are currently at this position here at around the 1st, 3rd of January. So they are really in the peak um, this coming week. Um, and then we would expect that whilst there will be a period of plateau, we would expect that to then follow this pattern and start to drop as well. Um, one of the other things we must also sadly remember is that after this um, peak is reached in healthcare, our death data will start to climb and peak um, a 10 to two weeks, 10, 10 to 14 days after that peak in hospital. So unfortunately, we're not really through the woods in terms of what our um, death data must look like, might look like. But I will also say that this wave, um, as you will be aware, the medical um, treatments that are available for COVID patients in hospital have been increased, as well as um, the knowledge around ventilation and what they call prone nursing, so nursing patients on their front, um, and that the um, 
survival date or the death rate is lower um, in this wave than it was in the first, thank goodness. I think that that, in terms of the epidemiology, what we call um, the data to, sh to show you, that was where I was going to um, leave it. But what I did want to also show you was when you go across here on the tabs on this website, there's this tab called Information Centre. And when you go into there, there is a weekly update called the weekly briefing. And if you go into that, there is a much more detailed report of um, the data across Berkshire that is written every week. It's in slide format, but you can just scroll through um, and it will show you both the information that we've just seen, but also in a comparative way. So you can, rather than flicking through all the different local authorities, you can see where we sit um, alongside our neighbours, but also the South East and the England picture. But this is done once a week. So bearing in mind what I said about the um, lag in time date, this is then done on a Wednesday night. So it will always tell you the dates, but you just need to be aware and make sure you um, look at those um, when you're um, looking through this report. And then there's an all showing you the data that we've just seen, the case rates in a graph form, but showing you it across the um, Berkshire across the county if, if that's of interest to people and there's a little bit more detail around ages um, and things like that so all of our ages are pretty standard at the moment they all look pretty similar which you would understand given that we're in a lockdown situation most schools are shut other than two um, key workers so we, we're all in a pretty similar situation in terms of um, the rules under which we are living currently and therefore the um, ages that we see um, are similar again it will show you the um, the graphs for excess mortality across Berkshire and some information on hospital activity and you can scroll through this so there's just much more um, detailed information once a week in this um, report which can be found by looking through those tabs um, at the bot at the top of the um, report then in addition there are there's a new tab here for those that have seen it before the website before this is a new tab called video stories and then there's some really interesting and good videos here from local medical professionals um, around the around the rules, but also around um, long COVID, around there will be some around vaccination if they're not already, they have been um, in the making as well as testing, etc. So some really interesting videos to scroll through and watch that will give you a lot of information. So as it within your role as um, COVID information champions, this is a real go to website for you to find out um, the answers to a lot of questions that people might pose to you or that you might have that you want to um, look at for yourself. So, so I would recommend um, having a look through if you haven't already and then um, looking at some of the detail um, in with some more time when you have that available to you. So I'm going to leave it there from public health, but obviously I'm here for the whole meeting and happy to answer questions um, as we go through. Thank you. Ingrid, thank you very much for that. Um, basically, what I would say, uh, the sources of information that Ingrid's just pointed out to you, any of the uh, champion volunteers basically who wish to, if you were in a position where you wish to share things on social media, some of those videos, charts, reports, maybe things you wish to consider. But um, uh, what I'd now like to do is introduce the next speaker, who is Dr. Rupa Joshi, who's a GP from the Woodley Centre Surgery. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Um, so thanks for that warm welcome. It's lovely to be here. Um, so I'm, um, as, as Charles said, I'm from Woodley Centre Surgery and I'm also the co-clinical director uh, for Wokingham North. And um, we're part of a primary care network of five practices. And there are four primary care networks in uh, Wokingham. There's um, the Early Plus and uh, South and uh, as well as North. And then we've got East as well. And all the um, primary care networks are currently vaccinating. Um, and I can tell you a little bit more about the sites and so on and, and what's going on across Wokingham a bit later on. Um, Rebecca's kindly doing my slides for me. So uh, next slide, please. I don't think they're going, um, they're moving along, um, but I'll, I'll carry on um, until the, the slides catch up, if that's OK. So um, what, what I'd like to do is go through. Oh, thank you. So go, go through what's um, what's involved and what we're doing at the surgeries um, the plan for further rollout and um, th how the, the whole community, the, the medical community is coping with COVID at the moment and, and what our strategies are. 
Um, next slide, please. So um, as we know, with um, COVID, it's a droplet infection. The larger droplets will go to the ground and the smaller droplets will um, uh, stay in, in the atmosphere and that's where we're breathing them in. Um, so we're making sure that within surgeries, we are um, wearing masks at all times and adhering to strict infection control procedures. Uh, next slide, please. So um, here is the uh, COVID-19 virus, the SARS-CoV-2. Um, we have the spike protein around the edges, which is the really important part where all the vaccines um, uh, are targeting. And we've also got the um, messenger, the RNA protein, the kind of DNA of, of the virus um, that's also integral for the vaccination procedures. Next slide, please. So, um, the, the, these are the vaccines that we're currently using, and I'd just like to explain a little bit about how they work um, and happy to take any questions later. So I'll start with the Pfizer vaccine, um, Pfizer-BioNTech, which is the one that um, we, we started off, and many of you probably have heard about the minus 70 degrees um, temperatures that they'd have to be transported to us by. So uh, what what we're doing in part of this virus is taking the spike protein that I uh, talked about in the previous slide and using the DNA code, so using the message of how to produce that spike protein. So that's been taken and then um, within a fatty envelope, um, it's been put, it's very, very delicate, so it can't be shaken. Um, we, we can't take it off site, so all of these have to be used um, within the surgery um, and transported very carefully from room to room. Um, and th that, that lipid envelope can break if, if shaken in the wrong way. They're, they're made up very, um, very specifically by agitating um, the, the vials about 10 times um, and then adding some saline and then agitating them in a, a particular way again. Um, so once that's injected, uh, the, the body then uh, take the cells take up that messenger RNA, that that um, code for how to make that spike protein into the cells, and then the, the cells then make that spike protein. This then organises an immune response, and and so if the body then um, becomes infected with the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it's already seen the spike protein and it can already mount that response. So the soldier cells are there, ready and waiting, should they be needed. So that's the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, and the second vaccine that we're using is the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So this is made by using a normal inactivated uh, cold virus, so a normal cough and cold type virus. And what we're doing is we're adding that actual spike protein onto the top of the virus, that gene of the spike protein. That then gets in in injected, and that's that's what we call a vector uh, vaccine. And same again, that spike protein get, um, gets taken up by the cells, and then uh, the antibodies to the spike protein then get produced. So. And um, really, they're very, very similar. It's just the the um, introduction, how they're introduced into the body. Both of them are producing um, the antibodies against the spike protein. Um, next slide, please. So um, the, the two vaccines uh, both have a very good um, conversion rate. So 90% um, for the Oxford and the um, Pfizer is about 94, 95%. So there's been a lot of contra controversy about um, how many um, to do the first dose and then waiting the 12 weeks for the second dose. Uh, the, the evidence is showing that the um, Oxford vaccine is actually better uh, when you um, have the second dose at 12 weeks. Um, and the and the Pfizer vaccine, we're, we're still doing a lot more research, but um, the, the feeling is that it's not going to um, cause any any difficulties in the long term for having that 12 week wait. Um, I, I think some of the the data that's been um, given about the the vaccine is that once it's injected, we were looking between a control group and the treatment group to see um, how many percentage of those caught. COVID. And obviously, when you inject a virus, it takes at least nine days or so um, for you to develop those antibodies. So um, once you take the data from that nine days onwards, it becomes a lot higher. 
um, at that 90% compared to what some people were saying of, of, of 70%, because um, at that point of injection, you haven't then developed the antibodies to, to the virus. Um, ne next slide, please. So I'd like to tell you about, a bit about vaccine trials, because a lot of people are saying that, um, that these vaccines have been rushed through, um, that, that they're not trustworthy. But the, the way that the vaccine trials normally work is, is phase one, you're looking at a very small number of people, probably about 10 to 100. And for the phase two, um, it's given to specific cohorts. So it could be the 65 to 75 year olds, or it could be the, the 40 to 65 year olds. So you're looking specifically for the safety and what happens in that particular cohort compared to other cohorts. And then phase three is when um, the, it's, it's given out to thousands and thousands of people, 45,000 people in, in the case of AstraZeneca. And then the stage is then um, that is being approved for um, mass consumption. Next slide, please. So what are the common reasons for people opposing um, the COVID vaccination? So we've talked about the safe, safe enough. I'll, I'll go through the side effects as well in a moment. Um, and people are still wondering whether COVID is in dangerous for, for health. So we, we now have variants, don't we? In the, in the first uh, wave, we didn't see uh, as many younger people affected. Um, but with this new variant, we are seeing more, more younger people in ITU than we did. Um, so I think it's really important to take this um, as seriously as possible. Um, some people are still rejecting vaccines on principle and and this this webinar um this meeting is very much an information meeting and and you know I wouldn't inflict my um my principles of, of vaccines on on people and I hope that that goes both ways that everyone is entitled to an opinion and I, I do wholly respect um, people's entitlement to their own opinions. Um, so next slide please. So here are the, the common side effects. I would say probably about 50% of people are experiencing these side effects. Um, usually uh, the next day after the vaccine's given, um, and it can last up to a week, but the worst side effects are the first 48 hours, I would say. Um, a lot of people are feeling tired. Um, there's been um, headaches, which do get relieved by paracetamol, general aches and pains. Um, the, the aches, um, you, you feel very heavy in your arms and legs, uh, difficult to lift them up. But as I say, you wake up the next day and, and uh, you feel much better and, and you, you don't notice any of those side effects. Um, and there are fevers coming on as well for about 48 hours. If the fever lasts more than 48 hours, it is recommended to, to get a COVID test just to be on the safe side. But most are um, getting better by then. Next slide, please. So I, I want to talk to you about the uh, priority groups next. So I'm sure you've heard um, that most, most of us are now almost through uh, cohorts one and two, which are the 80-year-olds and uh, residents that are in care homes and care home workers um, and uh, NHS staff, frontline staff. So um, I think as a surgery, we'll be finishing on Thursday because we just need to finish our housebound patients who are uh, over the age of 80. Um, we have completed all our care homes in Wokingham North, which is which is fantastic news. And across the rest of the PCNs in Wokingham as well, I, I, everyone's um, working really hard. Um, we've all been stood up. Um, we're working weekends. Um, we're working evenings to try and get as much vaccine as possible. And as soon as the supply comes in, um, we we are organising our clinics and, and getting patients in. And, and I have to say that the response has been overwhelming. We've been really touched by the kindness of all our patients and, and their gratitude to, to getting the vaccine. Um, there aren't many patients at all that don't want the vaccine. Um, most people are waiting by the phone and um, hoping for a call. Um, in the next uh, few weeks, we'll also be looking at the 70 to 79, as, as you've probably heard on the radio or the TV this morning, that, that we are now able to, um, we don't have to wait until we finish the 75 to 79 year olds, we can go straight down to the 70 to 75 year olds. And um, our shielded list, our clinically extremely in vulnerable patients, um, which we're keen to get vaccinated, who've been shielding since uh, February. Um, we are hoping to get 
the first four cohorts done by the middle of February, as long as we get that, that vaccine supply. Um, general practice is ready and willing. Uh, we just need to make sure that the, the, the vaccine is coming to us. Um, and then um, we have nine cohorts up to the 50 plus. Uh, next slide, please. So at, at the moment, we are phoning all our patients, um, but then we will hopefully go to text messaging um, and then something called AccuBooks, where you text message the link and patients can book in th their appointment slots um, themselves. And we're always saying, please wait for us to call you because we can't get through to people if all our phone lines are clogged up with people asking when their vaccine is going to be. So um, and we're asking our patients to be please be um, patient. And we are sending text messages out to say you'll be you'll be asked in the next week or you'll be contacted in the next week or two just to keep um, people um, advised on timescales and also putting things like that on our Facebook group. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what our clinic looks like. We've been really fortunate um, with our Wokingham volunteers um, who've been helping us with the parking, uh, making sure that our um, frail and elderly 80 plus year olds um, can park close to the surgery um, and don't have to worry about you know, getting anxious about driving around the car park, not being able to find a spot. So we check people in, we do their temperatures, um, and then they sit uh, waiting to go into the clinic rooms, um, socially distanced, of course. Um, and then once with the Pfizer vaccine, you've got to wait for 15 minutes. So um, they're observed in a different area um, and um, kept safe um, with, with plenty of clinicians on site. And we have a cleaning routine as well. Next, next slide, please. Um, as I was telling you earlier about the agitation of the Pfizer vaccine, and there's another marshal who, who's come to, this is um, uh, Paul, he's been at every one of our clinics, which is fantastic, really helpful, he's part of our PPG as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then we have our clinicians, and that's the end of our first clinic. We had a huge team, um, pretty much all our reception staff came in, um, and uh, we managed to get through um, a, over a, a, a thousand in that week, which is fantastic. Uh, next slide, please. So um, all of our staff have a lateral flow test before each uh, session and um, frequent hand washing, uh, PPE, um, and we've had an infection control site visit as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as we're working as a PCN, uh, our patients may be asked to go to other sites. So some of our patients have been to Wargrave surgery and um, also uh, that's us making up the vaccine in a, in a nursing home. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'd just like to very quickly touch upon what's going on. Next slide, please. Um, in it, that's going on. So general practice is working differently. We want to keep our patients safe. We're working more and more on telephone and videos and online. But of course, if we think that you need to come in, we will invite our patients in. Um, all paperwork is being sent electronically. We also have um, hot and cold sites. We've got our respiratory hub um, at the Broad Street Mall, which is a joint venture between all of the practices in Wokingham and Reading. Um, which all, all our surgeries provide staff for. And we also have a home pulse oximetry service, which is the saturation monitors. If we're worried about anybody, we will drop off uh, a saturation monitor and, and phone you, um, or you phone us if the saturations drop more than 92%, in which case um, we would get you into hospital. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, that's the last slide, perfect. So thank you for doing that, Rebecca, and thank you for listening, and I'll be here for, for answering any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rupa. Um, I think two quick points from me on that. If there's anybody on this call who wants to volunteer to help basically with delivery of the vaccine, we have had a, a very, very high response already, but if there is anybody else, contact the Working Volunteer Centre or the One Front Door Network, and you'll be called when you're needed. And otherwise, to say a big thank you to all of our GPs who I know are working tremendously hard on this. And, you know, Wokingham is ahead, basically, of several other parts of the country. And, you know, everyone here is just fully committed to making sure it stays that way. So um, on that note, I will say thank you to Rupa again and pass you over to Jake, who's going to talk about the CAB and One Front Door. Thank you, Jake.
Uh, thank you, Charles. And yes, two really uh, positive presentations. So hopefully this will be uh, a third. Uh, I'm just going to talk through mine now rather than do any presentation as we didn't want to um, burden you with loads of PowerPoints. But um, so um, good evening, everyone. And as Charles said, I'm Jake. I'm the chief executive here at Sitting Device in Wokingham. Uh, we've been supporting our communities since 1977 uh, with advice and information on issues around welfare benefits, debt, housing, employment law, relationships consumer and much more. And as the pandemic continued to rise in early 2020, um, we were talking with other voluntary organisations and the Borough Council about what we could do to be uh, helping out. So funded by the Council and delivered by Sitting Device Wokingham, the One Front Door approach began. So simply put, there really is no wrong reason to call us, because if we can't help, we will find someone who can. And it's more than a directory of services. Our trained volunteers and staff will ask the individual questions and go through a triage process. And this is important. Uh, the service nationally has for over 80 years um, had experience of helping people find a way forward. Starting in the Second World War, it was about navigating some of the changes uh, that the government would introduce them to support uh, communities and make sure people get what they're entitled to. So, for example, if we get a request for food, um, someone calls us saying they need help getting food and they're struggling financially, we don't just provide them with a food bank voucher or similar. We help them also with things like a benefits check, review of any debts, have they just lost a job and was that a fair process? Has there been a relationship breakdown or are they struggling with their mental health? Um, so we have that important mixture of the immediate support and so making sure they get access to the practical stuff that they need, such as getting food, uh, but also then that wraparound support to hopefully ensure that they don't need that support longer term. So from that first day of lockdown, uh, Wokingham Borough was able to respond, I think even before then we were starting to deliver the leaflets all the way across Wokingham Borough uh, and the service runs through telephone and email uh, or website referrals uh, that helps people get the services that they're eligible for. And since March last year, we've dealt with over 8,500 calls uh, and answered over 96% of them within seconds um, compared to a national average in sitting device of 10 minutes. So taking an average week at the one front door, we just wanted to give you some examples of some of the stuff that we will deal with. Uh, so preventing someone from becoming homeless, uh, supporting someone at risk of forced marriage, helping someone get their life back on track during suicidal thoughts, uh, negotiating with employers for settlements after wrongful dismissal or discrimination, um, helping a family's finances get back on track after dealing with their debts, ensuring someone with disabilities and without the internet access has support with food shopping, referrals to our local food banks and other food groups that are, are, are opening across the borough for immediate support, uh, along with that wraparound support as well. Helping someone uh, get access to their children, again, depending on relationship breakdowns and other problems, and um, talking carers through their rights and entitlements for uh, relatives or people that they're looking after. Um, referring and arresting to organisations like The Link for support calls to tackle social isolation. Housing support for someone who lost their job um, due to the pandemic. Uh, and referring parents to, to home staff for help and guidance on becoming a parent. So they're just, you know, some examples of some of the cases that we get on a, on a regular basis. And a great example of the One Front Door in action was actually during the first lockdown. So we received a call for help with food um, for the referral that went through to then the Wokingham Borough Community Hub, which was the food distribution hub. Um, from uh, March through to June and July last year. And through that assessment, we talked about their home circumstances. And unfortunately, um, the, the, the wife had identified that the husband was terminally ill. And through that conversation, um, they were talking about things like he was sleeping on a very uncomfortable bed. Uh, and that was somewhere that he was obviously spending a significant amount of time. So working with a local grant funder, uh, local United Charities, we were able to get an emergency grant to buy a new bed and a suitable mattress. But the challenge, as again, you'll remember from lockdown one, was how do we actually provide any of this support practically? How do we put the bed together? How do we get rid of the other one? And that's where the local COVID-19 support groups came in really, really well. So working with the Woodley group at the time, um, they were ready waiting for the delivery to help the family and the family were absolutely delighted and they actually ended up doing an interview uh, with the Wokingham paper uh, about that situation. Uh, it was dealt with within about a week. And there are plenty more examples of how that holistic wraparound support has been available for people. And I just reiterate that point of there being no wrong reason, because our, our, our fear during 
uh, the preparation for uh, the pandemic last year was just around making sure that if people needed help, they knew where to go. And, and we absolutely encourage people to contact the one front door for that. So some of those key strands have been access and food and other essential items. So our team would arrange for food deliveries from local groups, COVID groups, uh, Keep Mobile and others. Uh, link people up with other charities including food banks uh, and we also kept a, and still do a supermarket list up to date which is available on our website again particularly popular through 2020 but now thankfully um, pharmacies are, are more on top of this was access to prescriptions so working with local groups uh, and others we were um, able to help make sure they were collected and then delivered and particularly proud of that Jordan the first lockdown working with the likes of the Woking Volunteer Centre because any of you might remember there were queues of hour or two hours for uh, pharmacies at that point and people were really really worried and anxious about getting access to that um, medicine at the time. As I talked about before briefly working with Link uh, visiting scheme and others uh, for telephone calls to tackle social isolation uh, and then our advice and information that we provide through sit and device and the top five inquiry areas are, are certainly in Woking Gum are benefits, debt, housing, employment and relationships but we give advice on consumer uh, and much more and each of those issues as you'd imagine have seen a huge rise compared to 2019 um, and some of those cases are more than a phone call it can include taking people through and helping them prepare for things like court cases uh, and tribunals as well there are around 75 local charities and groups who receive regular referrals from the one front door um, so as i said again rather than having a list of 100 charities posted through everyone's door we're able to to filter people through uh, a triage process so as i touched upon earlier working with local funders uh, we're also um, provide an assessment for two key funds at the moment. So with Woken United Charities, we do the assessment for emergency grants of up to £500 for people in need. And this is the items that they've got from that include things like children's beds, refitting carpets in a house, uh, buying a new cooker or a laptop for the child at home. And uh, we've just had agreement tonight at their trustee meeting to also provide energy efficient packs for people who are experiencing fuel poverty um, as well. Uh, and then we're also doing the assessment for the COVID winter grant, the discretionary grant from Working and Borough Council. And this provides people with support on paying for things like food, energy costs over a month, and then they, people can come back up until the end of March uh, and boiler repairs as well. So as well as accessing those grant pots, uh, residents then also get advice from our debt staff and volunteers and other support through the charity to find a way forward uh, to hopefully not have to rely upon that type of hardship support longer term. Because I am a huge, huge, um, I, I just think that the, the charitable offer in Woking is 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 extremely fantastic uh, but obviously the key in this is not creating that dependency uh, on the hardship type support it's about how we make sure that that's available when people need it if people need it tomorrow we can get them to it but how do we move away from that uh, longer term such as through any poverty agenda and others and if support isn't available to give you confidence again we have twice weekly meetings chaired by one of our assistant directors of the council at martin and a number of local charities and organizations attend those meetings twice a week where we talk through the data that we're seeing through the one front door and all the other charities also give a, an overview and an insight into what they're seeing as well uh, and if there is anything that's missing we look at what stuff we can put in place uh, one example i think is really good is back again at, at the end of the first lockdown and link and age uk were talking about issues around mobility for people who had stayed home and shielded throughout the first lockdown and then working with the council they provided support um, through the people who were working in the gyms and leisure centres uh, and that was provided quite swiftly and we're now also working together on providing laptops to people who do not have uh, digital access um, we're also paying particular attention to mental health working with the council on this agenda and local gps and since the summer we've worked with early plus primary care network which is early shinfield north and winnish uh, and trialing that project it's shown that four weeks after the intervention from the one front door and our partner organizations individuals report better mental health and well-being and we're really proud to be training nearly 200 mental health first aiders by the end of june this year across the borough including council staff sit and device team and 72 staff and volunteers across wokingham and we still have places available for staff and volunteers 
and the charity sector across the borough for free. So please go on our website um, if you want to access that. So just to summarise, together as a Wokingham Borough Community Response, we've helped ensure hundreds and thousands of people can access food and prescriptions during an intense time of need. Uh, right in place just before the first lockdown um, and leading the one front door working with other charities we've made sure that people can get support. Um, our brilliant staff and volunteers have supported over 5,700 people through 2020 which was a 122 percent increase in 2019. Uh, again making sure that we were able to respond to the demand and the needs of our borough at a time where it was really really challenging for us all having to up and move to work from home and changing all of our systems and processes. There was absolutely no delay in providing that support for people across the borough and that wraparound support has also ensured that over £1.3 million of income gains was put back in Wokingham residents' pockets and we helped tackle debts of over £400,000 in that year as well. And just in terms of feedback, over 8 in 10 clients have said we helped them find a way forward with their problem. And the thing that encourages each and every one, I would argue even in the charity sector and the council and beyond, is that we have a huge impact on the lives of individuals, no matter how small or big that problem is. They're calling us at a time of need and arguably vulnerability, and we're really proud to be able to help. So if you or anyone you know could benefit from a helping hand, please visit our website. So it's Citizens Advice Wokingham wokingham.org.uk or just search Citizens Advice Wokingham on Google and our details are on the council website and social media and others and our telephone number uh, again we'll put it up on the chat and stuff is 0300 330 1189 and it's available Monday to Friday 9 to 5 and Saturdays 9am to 1pm. Thank you Charles. Thanks very much, Jake. Um, I'm now going to hand over to uh, Dave, who's going to basically go through the questions and field them out to the relevant uh, person to answer them. So over to you, Dave. OK, thank you. Thank you, Giles. Yeah, so if, if the, uh, the panellists or the, the presenters could um, come back on camera as well. And we haven't had a huge number of questions, but um, we'll run through them and I hopefully get the answers. Um, we had a few questions about the, the dashboard, um, Ingrid, that you, that you showed. Um, the first one was that uh, the different boxes, and I think this referred to the daily number of cases and the weekly rate of confirmed cases, they, they had different dates. I think one was based from Jan January 17th and one the 13th, and there's just a question as to why that was. So the dates that are there are, will be the date up until which that data is available. So, so case data, so the number of cases that are on there today will be the cases from yesterday. So that will say the 17th of January. But if it's about um, the rate, that will be pertaining to a seven day period that was about a week ago. So that will probably be up until the 13th at this point or thereabouts. So if it says up until the 13th, it's the seven days up until then. And unfortunately that rate that we get reported and what's reported in the news is always um, a good week out of date by the time we get it, although it's still the rate that we all focus on. That is the one that's reported in the national media. It's just that you need a good full seven days of data prior to where you are and with some of the um, delays or de when you have a test you don't get your result the next day so you need to have a, a little period of space before you account for that week in the data that's all so it's just a bit of an artifact of reporting but um but that is the one we work off so 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 that that's where we that's why the dates are different but it's important to look at them so you know which what you're looking at Okay, thank you. And also on, on the dashboard, um, is there any opportunity that the vaccination progress will be will be information will be placed on there? So I know that everyone's really keen to see data around the vaccination progress, and it's a little it's harder to do than you might imagine, and largely that's to do with the fact that the vaccination progress or the, the figures around how many people have been vaccinated are NHS figures, so they're held by the NHS. And that um, public health website is a local authority based website. So so it's a difference. I don't know if Rupert, if there's any plans to put that in an NHS setting in a CCG or somewhere, because obviously it's it's not our data at the moment to share. So. Yes, yeah, so we are, have been asked to do weekly returns. Um, so we're in the process of getting all that up and running. Um, it is there's a new computer system. Um, and as you know, with any new computer system, so we, we're 
are having to code all our vaccinations, but there's been a few hiccups. So um, I'm hoping that it, it will get it will get sorted. Um, it's difficult to grasp the data from that new computer system. Okay, I, can, I can certainly feed that back to the um, central team. And there was one I saw about doing a window of a smaller period of that, time. Yeah, that was the last one, which was, I think is one that we will feedback. That was a question from Councillor Fuin, who asked if the um, the trends could be shown over a shorter period of time, eight, ten weeks. And, and I can feed that back, certainly, actually. to the, And I know Charles um, mentioned that before, haven't you? Having a little box that pops out that yeah. might make that clearer. Dave, if I may come in here, basically, I've raised this with Public Health England, with Tessa Linfield, at least twice, basically, trying to get her to actually do this so um, again as Ingrid said basically it's or forgive me it may have been Rupert it's not our information at the moment as a council but we are lobbying to see this done basically because we know this is what people are asking us for okay thank thanks Charles and, and um, the next question we had is, is for Rupert and it was um, have the vaccines been tested for people who are um, clinically extremely vulnerable, and this refers particularly to those taking immune suppressants and are immunocompromised. So um, the AstraZeneca vaccine has uh, has been tested on a, a wider range of, of, of the population. Um, you are absolutely fine to take the um, AstraZeneca vaccine if you are on um, immunosuppressants. The only thing is that the immunosuppressants work on your immune system to dampen your immune system. So therefore, if you're having a vaccine to try and get you to produce an immune response, it may be that that immune response is not as strong as if you weren't on immunosuppressants. So you can still have the vaccine. There's no problem with that. Um, all, all, we, all we think is when we quote these figures of 94% and 90%, um, any, any patient on immunosuppressants, you may not have that high an immunity. It might not be 95%. It might be more like 90% or 85% or something like that. But it's definitely still worth having. Thank you. Um, and we've also been asked again for, for, for you, Rupa, um, is there anything in place such as a waiting list for those people who are available at short notice? Uh, should there be vaccines that need to be used within a set time frame and not enough bookings? Yes. Um, so because of the way that the vials work, um, when we open an AstraZeneca vial, there's 11 doses. So if for, we, we plan our clinics so that they're in groups of 11. Um, but if, for example, we get somebody that um, is unwell on the day and doesn't come or um, isn't able to have it because they've got some some kind of medical issue like an allergy or something like that, then we have a list of people to phone. Um, and, and some of those are healthcare professionals that haven't had, va had their vaccine yet. And some of them may be people that live quite nearby who are happy to come at short notice. Thank you for that. Um, and another question to someone who comments how, how fantastic it is the Woodley area is doing doing well with the rollout, but asking if there's any information about the Woking Medical Centre yes. and if there are any anything we've not there. So um, we were really fortunate that we went as wave one and wave two sites um, in Woking North, and that's because we have 3,400 over 80 patients over the age of 80. So that's why we were given that that rollout is we've got the highest um, population over 80 in, in the whole of Berkshire, West Berkshire. Um, but yes, um, Woking Medical Centre are doing a fantastic job. They started last week. Their numbers were phenomenal, actually. They they um, have a really good setup at the at the Bradbury Centre in the centre of Wokingham. Um, and I know that there's been huge amounts of praise about how, how well that's been orchestrated. So it won't be long. Um, and we are working really hard to make sure that we get through as many vaccinations as possible. Dave, if I can pick up on that one as well, because I actually had a note from uh, one of the people down there basically this week, well, the weekend actually, that they'd vaccinated 2,200 people in the week and with all but 170 being in the 80 plus age group. And they'd also vaccinated approximately 300 residents and staff in our older adult care homes. So the overwhelming majority of residents have been vaccinated in care homes. There's only one exception to that. And you know, so yes, they started a bit later, but they're cracking on with it at a great speed. Fantastic. Okay, thanks for that. Um, we've also been asked if the current vaccine being used in the area is the AstraZeneca vaccine or the Pfizer. What what, what are we actually using currently? We we started off with Pfizer for the first two deliveries, and then um, we have AstraZeneca 
across the patch at the moment. But but we don't know. It just depends on the on the delivery supply of what we're going to get next. But we're hoping it's um, it, it AstraZeneca at the moment. We're we're getting um, quite a lot of vials coming through this week, about two thousand, more than two thousand doses. So that's. Uh-huh. I would add to that, Dave, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Rupert, but my understanding is that the uh, the only issue stopping us from expanding the vaccine programme dramatically locally is supply. It's not the capability of the GPs or the PCNs. You know, if we can get the supply, we'll, they'll be vaccinating people as fast as they can. And it's important that message goes out to the wider community. Yes, absolutely. We're hoping that the vaccine um, supply is going to be ramped up in the next few weeks. That's what we've been told, hopefully. Lovely. Thanks for that. Um, we've been asked how people will be notified about their appointments and how much notice date they, they, they're receiving. Is it- um, so but as soon as we get the del- get the email to say that the vaccine will be delivered, um, that's when we start. Um, we've got a team on the phones that are uh, phoning patients and booking them in to appointments and then we may also use this text messaging service as well um, once uh, once we get to the appropriate level of cohort. Lovely, thanks very much. And just sorry, one more clarification we've been asked for on the vaccines there is, um, will people, if they have two jabs, they will always be the same vaccine, is that correct? Yes, um, so if you've had a Pfizer vaccine and your 12 week will be another Pfizer vaccine. And that, that's the guidelines at the moment. Same with AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca. Okay, lovely, thanks. I've probably um, bombarded you with enough questions over, but I'll move, move sure. on. Um, we had a question about how people contact the um, Citizens Advice in the front door. I think Jake did read out the number. We've also posted it on the chat and we will make sure the link is sent around to, to all attendees and to other champions and publicised widely. Um, we've had a couple of other general questions, which I'll, I'll pick up on, and if anyone else has any more information on, we can chip in. Um, someone has asked what feedback we would like from champions and whether we can take it sort of second hand. So if somebody is a representative of a community group and is told something about a, a particular location, not social distancing or something like that, can they report it second hand? And the answer is absolutely yes. We, we, we welcome any local intelligence and data that we can receive um, first hand, second hand. However, um, and again, we will the, the links to let us know about that are on the website, but we'll make sure they're sent out to, to everyone following this meeting. Um, we've also been asked to talk about um, COVID scams. Um, and just, just and if there's any information that we could give, and I don't know if it's Ingrid or Rupa, um, just, to, just to reassure people of the things that they won't ever be asked for, such as credit card details. Is there anything we could we could elaborate there? Well, I can certainly say from the NHS's point of view, um, I'm, I'm sure Rupert would agree. So you will will never be asked to input your own details, either certainly not bank details, but even your own address details or contact or email addresses, any kind of contact information via a text or email will not be asked for. You will be invited to a centre with a given address of where you need to be and a time at which you need to be there. Um, they shouldn't be asking for any information from you. I am also aware that there's been some scams, certainly I'd heard about it in the west of Berkshire, I haven't heard about it in in Wokingham, around um, companies offering, um, supposedly offering private tests or testing that you can buy, um, but just through a leaflet in the door. Again, that's there are companies that sell um, private tests, but they won't be putting leaflets through your door. Um, so just to be careful of anything that comes through of that nature, really. I mean, if you're worried about anything, then I would come to us as a COVID inquiries email at Wokingham um, Borough Council, and I would use that to send um, a, a query about whether something's legitimate or not, and we'll be able to confirm that for you. Lovely. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, we've also had a comment here that um, someone from Woodley has said how, how fantastic the one front door sounds, which I, I think we'd all echo, um, but suggesting they hadn't had any information through their door. So I think I'm very sorry about that. We ha- we've had, um, I think, three leaflet drops through, through the during the pandemic. Um, sorry if we've missed any addresses, but the information is is all on our website. We will be putting more information through doors as, as we can. And obviously, uh, uh, as community champions, we would hope that you will be able to find that information and disseminate it through your communities. Um, we've asked, been asked um, what we want from community champions. 
So um, I think what what there's two twofold. We want it to be a two way form of communication. We we want to use information sessions such as this and the regular emails we send out to provide champions with the accurate information they can use to disseminate into their communities and their community groups. So if you and and, and that doesn't matter whether it's just telling your friends, family, neighbours, or if you happen to be a member of a, a large community group where you can spread that information further, a anything that gets accurate information into the community is, is exceptionally helpful. Um, we're also asking um, for information intelligence back from champions about what's happening in their areas, both in terms of if there is a location, a business or something like that, where you're aware of potential problems, but also if you feel that our messaging isn't getting through to a particular um, demographic or particular part of the community, if we're missing anything out, if there's messaging that we should be using, um, we'd like to hear about that as well. So very much a learning process for the council as we try to get accurate information out to as many people as possible, and, and sorry, the NHS and, and the council try to get accurate information out to as many people as possible. Is there, is there anything, Charles, you'd, you'd feel we should add on? No, I mean, I think the information is vital and it can be basically if you know of a workplace, if you have seen something that you don't feel 100% comfortable with and want to contact us about it, please do not get involved yourself. You know, fill in the form, contact us and we will look into the appropriate response. And also if you post on Facebook in community groups, that, that you know, I've seen a lot of misinformation being put out about COVID, in particular case numbers, what's going on. It's really important information is accurate. So please share what we send to you with as many people as you can, with the confidence of knowing that it is the best information that is out there. Uh, thanks, Charles. Yeah, I, I believe we've only had one more question, which is just very specifically on the Oakwood Centre in Woodley and whether there's any opportunity for that to be used as a vaccination centre or any plans. Um, yes, um, they have been in contact and, and um, asked if we'd like to use the Oakwood Centre um, and we're going to do a, a site visit tomorrow um, to have a look around. But yeah, certainly um, we, it's a lovely location. It would be really good to have a um, vaccination centre over there, very close by to the surgeries. Lovely, thanks very much for that. Um, I think I can hand back to um, Charles now, because I believe we've answered all the questions that have been submitted. If there are any that we've unfortunately missed or any that occur later on, obviously do get in touch. We will be writing out a summary of, of the meeting um, and covering all those issues. Thank you, Dave. Um, well, firstly, I'd like to thank um, uh, Rupa, Ingrid and Jake for giving up their time basically to speak to everyone tonight. Um, I think in summary, I wanted to just pull out these key strands basically for people, which is uh, for anyone who's listening, basically wants to circulate information. You regularly read case numbers quoted on social media, in the newspapers, in basically on radio. All of it comes from the same place, which is the data you could see on the report that Ingrid uh, mentioned earlier. And if any of you can't remember the web address, all you need to do is Google Park Berkshire Public Health Dashboard and you will find it. So it's very, very easy, basically. And that's the place to go for information. Don't get the information secondhand, get it firsthand from the place where it comes from. And you can always have confidence that it is the most accurate it can be. In terms of uh, vaccination, uh, Rupert touched on this point, but just to reassure it, the message is please do not phone your GP, do not turn up outside asking for a vaccination, wait for the call. You will get the call as quickly as we can possibly get round to it. And if you want to volunteer to help the GPs with their effort, contact the Wokium Medical Centre. Yeah, not Wokium Medical Centre, sorry, the Wokium Volunteer Centre, that's what I meant to say. Um, uh, that's the place to go. And finally, uh, the one front door service, which Jake mentioned, which is the partnership between Working and Borough Council, the CAB, and is the route into all the other voluntary organisations across the borough. You know, the Link, the Working and Volunteer Centre, basically many other charities, but the poor place to go, if you know anybody who needs any help, any advice, anything at all, please phone that number. That's what it's there for. So finally, I'd like to thank you all for volunteering tonight for this. It's a really important role. And if any of you have any questions or want to contact me directly, my uh, email is charles.margets at 
don't worry about remembering that. You can find that on the council website. So thank you very much. And I think that means good night as well. But Dave, correct me if I'm wrong. No, that certainly does, Charles. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night.